Um, this morning we're in Luke chapter 5, and we're, we're, we're taking on the second part of a series. It's okay if you missed the first one. It's not really, uh, it's not a carryover. It's just two stories of, of, of Jesus healing someone. And uh, so we're in the second passage of that this week. If you want to go ahead and get your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke uh, chapter 5 and starting in uh, verse uh, 17. Real quick before we get into that, I want to share a story with you. Several years ago, um, I went to a faith-based convening over in Hazard, Kentucky, and, um, and, and this was, I don't know, seven, eight years ago probably, and, um, and I met a man there who was speaking on a panel, and his name was Lonnie Riley, and, um, and I had, uh, my entire life, I've grown up around church, uh, grown up around the Bible, grown up around Jesus, hearing about Jesus, hearing about faith. And yet something different happened when I met, uh, met Lonnie. And Lonnie was up and he was sharing a bit of his story about how God had worked in and through uh, his life. And uh, I'm going to share just a little bit of his story. I'm not going to do it justice. This, this deep, we could spend a whole day talking about how God has worked through Lonnie's ministry. Uh, but long story short, Lonnie was a, a pastor uh, for many years, a Baptist church pastor, and uh, part of the association, statewide conferences, all the things. And, and he was originally from Hazard, Kentucky. His wife, Belinda, uh, is from Harlan County, Lynch, Kentucky. So they got married. They went off into ministry and were pastoring churches. He pastored a church in Ohio, Kentucky, uh, Alabama, Tennessee, different places. And um, it, he, was, he was a pastor in a church in Alabama just across the state line from Tennessee, and uh, his wife got the call that her mother had passed away back in Lynch. And he was pastor at a good-sized church, probably 500, 600 people, living comfortable, as he would say. He had a nice home in a nice neighborhood, had a bass boat, had all the things, you know, you dream of in life, spend the Saturdays on the lake. And so they, they come back to Lynch, Kentucky, uh, to take care of her mom's estate and for the funeral. And, um, and she had a house there, one of the old coal camp houses, if you know Tri-Cities of Harlan County, these were coal towns. And uh, so they come back, and, they, they, and, and then they're leaving, they take care of their business, and they're leaving, going back, uh, at Mississippi, it's not Alabama, it's Mississippi, they're leaving, going back, and uh, Lonnie said on their way back, he felt God speak to him and say, Lonnie, I, I need you to move back to Lynch. I need you to move to Lynch. And uh, he said he felt it as clear as day, felt it in his spirit and his heart. And so uh, he and Belinda wrestled with that a little bit, shared it with her, and they prayed about it. And uh, they made this decision that they were going to step down as pastors. They weren't moving back to Lynch to pastor a church. They were simply moving back to Lynch because God told them to move back to Lynch. And, and what I began to hear in Lonnie's story is he began to share what happened after that. That moment, that time in their life was now probably 25 years ago. And at the time I was listening, it was 15, 20 years prior. And he began to share the stories of what happened when he got back to Lynch. And it's, a, it's an amazing story. There's a documentary about it called It's Only Cookie Dough. And one of the first things that happened is they moved back into her mom's house, and he just kind of starts working on it, starts meeting neighbors. <coughs> and then one day, um, this, this, these boxes of frozen cookie dough show up on their doorstep. No idea where they came from. Still don't know where they came from. And he carries them inside. He says, Linda, what are we going to do with this cookie dough? And, uh, and she's like, I've got one idea. What do you think it was? Make cookies. Right, he's like, we're going to make cookies. We're going to make cookies. And so they made up all these cookies and began to deliver it to their neighbors and began to build relationships. And so and when he shares his story of faith, he says, what God gives us is uh, it's only cookie dough. Like he gives us the things, he's at work around us all the time, inviting us in to join him at work in our community. And this was so eye-opening to me, it was shaking my world because it was not just not just faith I heard about, it was faith that I could see. And so this morning, I want, I want to talk to you about this thought, faith you can see. Faith that you look at Lonnie and say, you were pastoring, he makes this decision and he moves back to the lynch not knowing what God's going to do, how God is going to use him. 
And it's amazing to hear him talk. He says, I'm just in the Father's hand. I just open my hand, and if God calls me to do it, then, then we'll go do it. It's not, I'm not planning all this out. It's responsive. God is at work at Lynch, Kentucky, just like he's at work in Pikeville, Kentucky. So there's story after story of how Lonnie's ministry began to grow, and, and it was always people would come say, do you have this? He's like, I don't have it, but if God gives it to me, I'll give it to you. And continually, God would provide it. Uh, there was one story where, where they, they, uh, the old uh, land company owned the old miners' hospital there. And Lonnie thought, God wants us to have that. If God wants us to have that building, he will provide it. He will pay for it. And so the guy for the company that was trying to sell it would call him and say, Lonnie, uh, are you going to buy this place? He's like, yeah, we're going to buy it. He's like, do you have the money? No, I don't have the money. <laughs> and they said, well, you've got to have it by this date. And so this date kept coming up. And, and, and the day before that they ended up buying this piece of property, uh, a ministry partner in, in Georgia or somewhere called him and said, God just told me to wire you this amount of money. And it was like $20,000. Like it was the number he had left. And so he called the guy. The land agent uh, from the company comes to Lynch, and they meet beside this hospital that Lonnie's getting ready to buy for his ministry, not himself. And he's watched Lonnie through that process just say, if God wants to give me this, I'll have the money at the time. And the guy sees it happen, sees the money come through, and gives his life to Jesus at the door to the hospital. Because he was in awe of what God could do. So this morning what I want to talk to you about is faith that you can see. What that hospital turned into was a retreat for volunteers and mission teams First year, the first summer they were there, hundreds of people showed up. Now thousands of people show up every summer in Harlan County and are just doing work in, all around the community and, and the county. And they, they have a horse farm now. They have a coffee shop. They have the old miners' hospital. They have the bathhouse. They have, like God is doing so much in that place because one man said yes. And what I left in all of that day when I heard Lonnie's story was not of Lonnie. It was, wait, God is like this? God is not just in that in the Old Testament, but he can be that today in Pikeville. And I began to say, God, what could you do in Pikeville where I am? What could, you do in the, what could he do in your neighborhood where you live? And sometimes we put a lid on that, but Lonnie's faith in action blew the lid off my mind of what I thought God could do. And so we began, we were early on, we had just started New Beginnings and so I immediately said, Lonnie, can you come share one Sunday at New Beginning? So early on, he came over and preached. And uh, some, of you, some of you here today were here then. A few of you I see around the room. And you felt the contagious fire of his faith. And it didn't make you love Lonnie. It made you love God and, uh, and want to follow him. So we began to pray about, God, what could you do in Pikeville? And that's been our heart at New Beginnings ever since. So what does this have to do with the scripture we're in? Let's read it. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat uh, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. In verse 20, Jesus sees their faith. It says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God could forgive sins. And Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why you question this in your heart? Is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising 
God. In verse 26, it says, everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. All right, are we ready? We're going to look at this scripture in a little bit of detail. A few things to, to understand here about the power of faith that you can see. I want to start just in verse 20, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these. We're not going to hit, go deep on every verse. I just want you to see this, this, this big idea of a faith that you can see. It's, it's a, uh, a, a, the inverse of this can remind you that there's something lacking in a faith that can never be seen. That a faith that does not impact the way you live and what you do, that there's something lacking, that God has called us into something bigger than that. Faith in Jesus was meant to be observable. It was meant to transform your life in such a way that people around you can, could, could see it. And James taught us this. He said, faith without works is dead. We know the scripture also says that we are called to walk by faith, not by sight. Man, I'm thankful that God has brought people into my life so many times that I've been able to see their faith. And I left inspired and encouraged by what they had done in a way that drove me closer to Jesus and a deeper walk with him. Never perfect, but deeper, closer, more trust that changed the way I began to live and my dreams and my plans. And Bethany and I wrecked our whole life. Just wrecked it in a beautiful way. But this faith that Jesus saw here was extraordinary faith because the, the men, they were carrying their paralyzed, their paralyzed friend, and they get there, and they're lined out, right? They couldn't get into him, but they had this extraordinary determined faith that they knew if I can get our friend into the presence of Jesus, if I can help my friend encounter Jesus, he will never be the same. And so as I was reading that, I was thinking about how many friends do we have that we would love to get to encounter Jesus? And many times the way they will encounter Jesus is through a faith they can see in you. And so Jesus said he saw their faith. So they get there and they couldn't get to him. So they, they, there's usually in the homes at the time, there were outside stairs that went up to a flat roof. And so they go up to this roof and it would have been mud and different things. It was dried and, and, and they, would have, they began to take off panels and break away this roof. I mean, this is determined faith. They're getting ready to lower this man down in there who's paralyzed. And guess what? They're not thinking they're going to have to pull him back out. They got so much faith, they know if I can get him down there, he's going to be healed. And so they were, un this, un this determined faith up the side of the stairs, and probably the other people were like, where are they going up on the roof? And Jesus just in there teaching, man, probably best sermon he's ever taught, because everyone had to be, be like, he's God, I feel like they had to get better, or, I don't know. It's the best sermon he's ever teaching, he's got all these Pharisees gathered around, poking holes in, trying to find him saying something wrong. And he's just teaching, and all of a sudden, like, what in the world? You know, imagine I'm preaching here, and somebody comes through the roof. It's a bit distracting, right? Disruptive. And, but, but Jesus didn't see. He, he, he saw their faith, because they were living it out. They had come up. They had ripped the roof off to get to Jesus. And it says he, he saw their faith, and so he says, young man, your sins are forgiven powerful to me to see that we're reminded of last week. Remember we said God cares more about our spiritual health than our physical health. He, he cares more about our, our, our spiritual relationship than our comfort on this side of heaven. And so he looks at this man as paralyzed and he realizes his deepest, greatest need is not to walk. He doesn't start there. He realizes his greatest, deepest need is that his sins have separated him from the God of all creation. 
And that because of that, because of his sins, it's not made him paralyzed, but it has broken his relationship with God and means he's eternally going to be separated from it. It's this idea that we have to pause for a minute and be reminded of, of the entire gospel message. The entire gospel message is not that God looks down on us and is mad that we keep messing up. And then we get saved, and he's like, all right, you're doing good. You've committed to do good, but then you mess up, and then he gets mad at you again. This is sometimes what we'll begin to think. I want you to understand that what happened is mankind rebelled against God, and we became sinful. Because of that sin, we came under the curse of death. It means the wages of sin are death. When Jesus talked about his heart, he said he was gentle and lowly. And when you read through the scripture, you find that what he looked down upon was a humanity who was under the curse of sin. That could not dig yourself out. He's, he's mad at sin. He hates sin. Don't get me wrong about that. But he's broken hearted because you can't cure yourself. You can't. He's like, they can't do it. They can't get it. They, they can't do it. So so I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go in the person of Jesus, and Jesus is going to be born, and, and Jesus was born, and he lived this perfect life, sinful, righteousness. Uh, Darina Coleman, this week in one of her classes, she said, perfection died with Jesus. It doesn't exist anymore. What a good line. I'm, like, I'm using that one. Perfection died with Jesus. And so he lived the perfect life, and so the punishment of death we all deserved, he didn't have to take it. He willingly died on the cross in our place. All of the wrath of God towards sin, what he's mad about sin, was poured out on his own son. So that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That simply by putting our faith and trusting in Jesus, we would be made righteous and holy and reconnected with God immediately. It would set us free from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. No longer the wages of sin death, because I've been brought into new life. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am not going to die. I'm, I'm not going to be eternally separated from God because of the work of Christ. He also broke us free from the, the power of sin. He gave us some things. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit, from one, takes up residence inside of us. He gave us his scripture to guide us and show us right from wrong. He gave us, he organized and perfectly planning the local church, a body of believers that you get in community with. These three things he gave us to help us break free from the power of sin in our life so that we could become more and more like him over our life on this earth. Never perfect, but changed nevertheless. All right? And so this is what he does for this man. He doesn't give him legs. I love this, this guy, David Guzik. He said this about it. He said, what good would it be if the man had two working legs and walked right into hell with him? Man, that's a line, isn't it? So he starts at his deepest place, and you think you need, we'll think we need all kinds of other things. We think we need relationships healed. We need, we need physical healing. We need financial help. And, and he's like, no, no, Jared. I've already taken care of your deepest and your most important the thing that matters the most, I've taken care of it. Your greatest need is Jesus Christ. Then the Pharisees, the teachers, they've been waiting for this moment, and it came. He blasphemed. He blasphemed. They're thinking to themselves. Maybe they were looking at themselves, and, and you know, uh, Jesus may have supernaturally knew their thoughts, but he was maybe just discerning. You know how you can look at somebody and know what they're thinking sometimes? You've been there. And so he's looking at them, and he sees them, and they're, they're thinking it's on their face. Maybe they're whispering to each other. It's like, who's he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. 
Only God could do that. How could this man, this rabbi, he's a rabbi like us, how can he claim to say your sins are forgiven? And they say only God can forgive sin. And I love Jesus' response. It was like, right. You're finally getting it, guys. That's the best thing you've said all day. Your whole life, you finally got it. And it was sarcastic. In their words, right? And so, he says, I'll prove to you. I'll prove to you. I'll prove to you. Which is easier for me to just say that and you not know whether it really happened? Or for me to take this paralyzed man and heal him right in front of you? So he turns to the paralyzed man and he says, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And we find that immediately the man picks up his mat and goes home. And everyone is in great wonder and awe. My dream, my heart, for every ministry and life that New Beginnings touches is that we are a community of people whose actions, whose faith that can be seen leaves neighbors, leaves unbelievers, leaves family members, le le leaves the, the greatest uh, skeptic about God. Just at least leave them because of our action and our steps of faith. Leave them in great wonder and awe, at least getting them thinking, what is, the go what is going on? These people are making decisions contrary to the world and temporary life. They're, thinking, they're making eternal questions. They're taking these leaps of faith. They're, they got a boxing gym. A church has a boxing gym. No, God has a boxing gym. You know, God can reach people however and wherever and through whatever he wants. We just got to be willing to say, God, if you want to have a boxing gym, we'll have a boxing gym. If you want to have a coffee shop, then we'll have a coffee shop. I remember asking Lonnie early on. He had, he had this horse farm. He had all these things. I was like, Lonnie, man, how do you get all this stuff? He's like, I don't. God has it. If he brings it to me, we do it. We'd been like six months, and we'd just been meeting on Sunday mornings. I'm like, where's my horse farm? <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, God, where's it at? Now, nine years later, what I hoped would leave other people in great wonder and awe of God has left me in great wonder and awe of God. Never thought we would own a, an auto parts store. Never thought we'd be dreaming of a community center. I never thought... Actually, I would think those things, but then the flesh would be like, but where, but how, money, partner, people. I never thought. We prayed about Celebrate Recovery here on Monday nights for probably two years. We wanted to have Celebrate Recovery. Then I met LaGina Lane, and she had been doing, leading Celebrate Recovery in Prestonsburg, and she, she comes to us, and she says, listen, God has wrecked my heart and is telling me to come home. I live and work in Pikeville. I want to be in Pikeville. And I lead this ministry called Celebrate Recovery. Do you know anywhere, anybody that would help us get that launch? I was like, God has the place for you. She's like, no, this was an exploratory meeting. I was like, no, you start Monday. <laughs> right? This is clear. God is doing this. God is doing this. You've heard the story about the part store. We were, we were there with the mission team. And, and, and I was sharing the vision that Mayfield originally had about a youth center and all these things over there. And one of the middle schoolers from Southland Christian Church looks at this part store that was a disaster at the time and says, that, that'd be a great building for that. I'm like, no, not that one. We don't own it. It's not. And, and then we find out just like six months later that they'd messed all the deed up. And the minute he was saying that, we already owned it. And I was like, great wonder and awe, right? Great wonder and awe of God. Gripped with great wonder and awe. As the worship team comes up.
faith you can see affects those who see it. It's like, oh, that's pretty simple. But we forget it. Because you can be convinced to think your sin, your doubt, your faith is only about you. Think I'm just making a decision for my own future and my own eternity and whether I'm going to believe or not and do I not or do I yes. You know, we find here that our kids, our spouses, our neighbors, what we do with our faith and how we choose to follow and surrender and give to Christ affects everyone around you. Our mission team, uh, our students that were going this morning, uh, this was a picture they grabbed. That's Steve on the left. He's their bus driver. And he's scared about where Billy is sitting right now. <laughs> See, Steve's been their bus driver for many years now. Every summer, he, they get the same bus driver. Steve was not a Christian when he started taking them on mission trips. And yet, over the years, there was something about the faith of these children, these students, and the faith of the volunteers, the, the adults who would, who would take their only week of vacation they get for the summer. And that doesn't make sense to go on a mission trip and work the entire time. And a couple years ago, Steve, on a mission trip with, with our student ministry, gave his life to Christ. Because faith that can be seen affects others. And so I'm going to invite you into a place over the, the, the foreseeable future. I want you to think about this week. God, where can I make extraordinary leaps of faith where I trust you? For some of you, that can be so simple. It could be you're, you're a young believer. You've just gotten saved, but you've never gotten baptized. It's the first place. It's the first place. Stepping out in faith and saying, I'm going to let the whole world know I'm going in that water. I'm following Jesus. Is that simple? For some of you are in such a deep emotional uh, distress in a place. Sometimes, how, what, what are people going to see in me? What can I do? I don't have a horse farm. I'm, you know, I'm not quitting my job and going into some ministry. Maybe it's just you don't quit. Maybe it's something supernatural inside of you that people can see, even though you've got every reason to be down on yourself and down on your marriage and down on your, your life, that you still smile and you have this unspeakable peace that people can't understand. But there's some place, some way, God is inviting us all in to this faith journey with Him. To not just have faith that saved us, but to walk it every single day day and to see where he can provide and allow those around us leave them in great wonder heavenly father we come to you this morning we we know and we know that you have asked us to walk by faith but it's so much easier to walk by sight God, we pray that we could live lives that, that, are, that are holy, that are righteous, that are obedient, that, that draw us, that, that bring attention to you, that, that, that maybe, maybe we've walked such a burdensome life, maybe we've been in addiction, maybe we've been in jail, maybe we've, we, we've been in any of those lives, yet you're going to turn us around, you're gonna, people are going to see us walk in a different life, and in that they say this great wonder and great awe of this man named Jesus. God, we pray we surrender as individual believers here in this body, as, as this, every ministry we're involved in here in this church, that, that we never, we never put a lid on what you can do. God, we'll make plans in our hearts, but we trust you to direct our steps. God, as you give it to us, we'll be faithful stewards of it. God, we pray you do things in and through us that would leave our neighbors in this place in great wonder.